Um, so before I start, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I live in Berkeley. Um, I, I've never been, if you can believe it, to the Brower Center, but I have a David Brower story that I, that I would just want to share with you before I start. Um, I moved to California 35 years ago uh, to be a graduate student, actually, at the Energy and Resources Group, which is one of the members of the, of the coalition. And I came out in April to visit, because I was trying to decide where to go. So I came out in April uh, to interview with Professor John Holgren, who was the head of the Energy and Resources Group, whom I had never met. Uh, John became a good friend. He was my, my graduate mentor. He's today President Obama's science advisor. But I'm, I'm waiting outside his office at the Energy and Resources Group up on campus and uh, for my appointment. And he's in a meeting. And, and so his meeting ends, and the door opens to his office. And a scruffy graduate student and a distinguished older man with silver hair come to the door. And they finish their conversation, and they shake hands. And the distinguished older man with silver hair turns and leaves leaving the scruffy graduate student looking guy standing in the office. And that turned out to be John Holdren. And the guy who had just left turned out to have been David Brower, uh, who was in a meeting with John. And I, I had the opportunity to meet, meet David Brower many times after that. And actually, the, later that same day, I met Amory Lovins. It was a very exciting time, uh, as, as some of you might imagine. But that was my introduction to, to David Brower, who already was a hero of the environment uh, and for those of you who don't know David's history with the Sierra Club and efforts in the water world to deal with uh, preventing big dams in the, in the Grand Canyon, I'll come back to that a little bit later in my talk. My talk today is going to be about the future of water. Uh, it's an issue that's at the intersection of science and environmental science and economics and political science and local politics uh, and sociology and ecology and, and almost everything else. I, and I give a lot of talks on global water issues, on climate change, on sustainable water management uh, related topics, but I've especially been looking forward to giving this talk uh, because it gave me the opportunity after I got the invitation to sit back and think a little bit more broadly than I usually do about the water fights that are such an important part of both the water world but the environmental world more generally. Uh, here in, in California and in the United States and internationally. And so let me begin by observing that uh, sometimes working as a scientist or as a conservationist or as an environmental advocate, uh, the, the news can be a little bit depressing. Every day there's bad news out there. Uh, another battle lost, another step backward in the fight to protect some of the resources that, that we care about. Uh, step in the wrong direction, political pushback by different kinds of political entities, strong vested interests who have vested interests in, in the direction not of protecting environmental resources or the planet, but, but in the other direction. Uh, distressing ignorance in Congress about the science uh, and the environment, or worse than ignorance, outright disdain worries that even our political friends or allies aren't moving quickly enough in, in the right direction when we have a president who, to some degree, understands environmental issues more than previous presidents and yet faces serious political opposition in moving an agenda forward in the right direction. I don't know if you saw the New York Times today, but the front page story about Lake Erie uh, and growing algal blooms in Lake Erie and the deterioration, continued deterioration of Lake Erie all right, so that's a battle that we fought in the 1960s, and the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act were in part passed because of the disaster that was Lake Erie. And Lake Erie, Lake Erie improved enormously over the subsequent decades, but once again is deteriorating uh, in, a, in a way that we don't seem to be able to control. So all of this is true, and, and all of this is, de is disheartening. But uh, I'd like to offer a different perspective. I actually believe that, that science and public opinion and continued efforts on the part of communities uh, and citizens and, and educational institutions and laws and policies are slowly but surely moving us actually in the right direction. Uh, that we take steps back, but we're also taking steps forward. 
toward a sustainable future. Bad things that we used to do or proposed doing a quarter of a century ago, uh, we didn't do. Good things that we know we ought to be doing, we're increasingly starting to do. And so let me give you some examples. We don't have 50 or 100 nuclear power plants up and down the coast of California. That's something that in the 60s and 70s, we thought we were going to have. That, that's what the plans were. We put in place coastal protections, at least to some degree. We didn't develop the Marin Headlands for a massive multiple thousand home development, which we planned to do. We didn't develop Point Reyes, which we planned to do. We didn't build dams in the Grand Canyon, in part because of the efforts of people like David Brower. We didn't build fleets of commercial supersonic aircraft that without a doubt now would have destroyed the ozone layer. Uh, and we didn't do it because the science suggested it was a bad idea and the policymakers agreed. Indeed, we implemented and passed bans on DDT and ozone depleting chemicals and acid rain producing chemicals. Uh, interestingly enough, when the debate about DDT was underway, there were no peregrine falcons east of the Mississippi and there were two nesting pairs of peregrine falcons in California. And this morning, actually on my, on my computer, when I'm bored, uh, there's a video cam that is watching in live real time a peregrine falcon nesting on the top of the PG&E building in San Francisco. And you can call it up and you can watch this peregrine sitting on, at the moment, three eggs on the top of the building in downtown San Francisco. And it's voyeurism of some kind. I, I cannot take my eyes away from it. It's incredibly boring. Um, and yet, all right, so a little digression. It's a male peregrine falcon brooding these three eggs. The female laid the three eggs, and then for reasons that we don't fully understand, she left. And the male could have abandoned the nest, but the male started brooding these three eggs. And that's what you're watching on the video. And a female has actually appeared, and we don't know whether the female is going to start brooding or whether when the eggs hatch, if they do hatch, uh, she'll start feeding them. We don't know. But, but we passed a ban on DDT, and the peregrine falcon population nationwide and the bald eagle population nationwide and many other, uh, other birds have recovered because of the, the right thing that we did in terms of DDT. We saved the whales, or, or some of them. Uh, we saved the redwoods, or, or some of them. And in general, fundamental support for environmental perceptions, environmental positions, uh, among the general public is growing, not shrinking. It's getting larger and larger every year, and it gets better with every generation. I think we have to accept that we're in this for the long haul. There's never going to be a shortage of bad ideas or inappropriate development plans or vested interests that favor money over the environment. But I believe that a century from now, the next generations are going to look back on this century, the, the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, uh, the way we now look back on the anti-slavery movement and the suffragette movement and the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement uh, and other examples where social mores and assumptions and values slowly but inevitably changed. And, and I think that's the good news. And all of these arguments and all of these observations apply to water. And the, the title of my talk, which I think Rebecca probably chose, <laughs> is an audacious vision for water in the city of the future. And it could have been, will we solve our water problems? Or do we have water problems? Or, or what's a sustainable vision for California water or for, or for global water? It could, it could have been any number of things. And so in my talk, I'm going to try and talk about all of those, uh, uh, all of those issues. I'm going to talk broadly about our water problems. I'm going to talk specifically about water problems. I am going to talk about uh, a sustainable vision for urban water, although some of the other speakers that you're going to hear about are going to talk more about those things in more detail. Uh, because we do, to some degree, have a California water crisis. We certainly have a global water crisis. We have an urban water crisis. We have an agricultural water crisis. 
in different forms, in different definitions, in different periods of time, in different places. Um, and I realized that, that many people criticize the environmental community for making everything a crisis. Uh, and I'm, I'm sensitive to that argument. But let me explain at least to some degree why I think we do have a water crisis. What's the worst water problem that we have worldwide? It's, it's not the Delta. It's not the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. It's not whether or not to build a couple more reservoirs uh, or desalination plants in California or a peripheral tunnel. Uh, it's the failure to provide basic clean water and sanitation for all of the world's population. It's the 21st century. There are almost a billion people worldwide that don't have access to safe drinking water and two and a half billion people worldwide, give or take, that don't have access to adequate sanitation, something that everybody in this room takes completely for granted. And we take it for granted because our cities and our, our communities built sophisticated, integrated water and sanitation systems 110 or 120 years ago. And we got rid of water-related diseases. Those things that still happen today because of the failure to meet basic human needs for water and sanitation worldwide. And I was talking to Rebecca at lunch, and she's done a lot of work in Bolivia, and she told me that, and was it in Bolivia? She came down with typhoid, waterborne typhoid, which was a, a disease common in the United States and Europe in the 1800s, and the earliest part of the 1900s, but a disease that we got rid of when we put in place in our cities the water and sanitation systems that we have today. And it's a bad one. She survived, but not everybody did. A lot of people died from typhoid and cholera, and still do, uh, and dysentery and guinea worm and schistosomiasis, schistosomiasis the, the things that we get, humans get, when we don't have safe water and sanitation. And so if there's any definition alone of water crisis, that's a crisis. That's a failure to meet basic human needs for something that's as fundamental as it comes. But we also have serious and unresolved and contentious water problems here in the United States and in the Western United States and in California. And I would note, even in California, there are populations that do not have access to safe drinking water. Uh, at the Pacific Institute, my institute in Oakland, we put out a report about a year ago looking at populations in the Central Valley, low income, primarily Hispanic populations, that are drinking water with too, much, not too many nitrates in them with concentrations of nitrates that exceed safe levels. And it's a problem we've known about for over a decade and we have failed to resolve that problem. Those nitrates come from agricultural runoff, they come from septic tanks that are badly designed, they come from confined animal feeding operations, big centralized feeding operations that dump slurries of animal wastes on the ground that seep into our groundwater. Uh, and that's a problem even here in California where low-income communities do not have access to safe drinking water. California is a big state. We have a lot of different kinds of problems that face us. We have a, a, lar a lot of people, over 35 million or so. Uh, we have a vast land area. We have different kinds of communities with different backgrounds and interests and priorities. And so it should be no surprise that our perceptions about water, even in a place like California, differ. So let me talk a little bit about those perceptions. Uh, the agricultural perspective. So 80% of the water that humans use in California goes to agriculture. And California is a wonderful place to grow food. Central Valley has some of the best soils in the world. There's water available, the climate is fantastic, and we grow a lot of food for California, for the United States, and for the rest of the world. And the agricultural community feels that their use of water is the most important, not just in terms of volume, but because it produces food, a fundamental critical need for California and the rest of the world, not just our food. And so changes to water rights and allocations or return of water to the environment or uh, growing demands in the urban centers or changes in the status quo and water rights, they feel risks overturning a hundred years of culture and tradition and critical needs in the Central Valley and other parts of the state as well. Some farmers feel that losing water to the urban centers and to urban development risks losing their communities and their way of life. They see with some justification 
a hundred acres of farmland is a much more attractive thing than a hundred acres of McMansions and suburban development. So what's the environmental perspective? The environmental perspective argues that humans use too much of the water that used to all belong to some degree to the environment and that has and that that human use of water has led to degraded ecosystems and 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 species threatened with extinction and disappearing wetlands and loss and destruction of the the Pacific Flyway that supports bird populations in Latin America all the way up to the Arctic, uh, and endangered fisheries, uh, and devastated, you, you get the idea, you've heard that story. And the environmental community believes that current water policies are threatening a large part of what makes California such a wonderful place, part of the reason why a lot of us are here, and I, you know, I came 35 years ago and never left, in part because of the environmental values that make California a wonderful place. So what's the urban water perspective? Urban water users believe they produce far more value in terms of dollars or productivity or services to people with every gallon of water than do other water users around the state. And that rational water policy urban users feel would meet their needs as a top economic priority. Our cities are growing relatively fast, faster than our rural communities. Uh, we have serious concerns about the reliability of our urban water supply for the long term. We have serious concerns about the quality of urban water, all of which you'll hear more about later today. Uh, and so the urban perspective in part says, let's figure out how to meet the highest economic value for the largest number of people uh, in a rational water policy. And, and we don't have a rational water policy that guarantees those kinds of, of water systems at the moment. There's a perspective from the environmental justice community. The social justice communities of which the environmental justice, justice community is a part have long felt that their voices are not being heard in water policy at all, that they're not playing a role in urban or agricultural or, frankly, the traditional environmental debate over water. And yet, uh, to many, the, there's a perception that many of the poorer communities in California bear a disproportionate impact from the water policies that we've put in place. And the example I gave you about nitrates is one example where the poorest communities in the Central Valley have had effectively no say on water policy, on who gets to use water, on how water is allocated, on how waste waste water is treated and disposed of, and yet they bear the economic costs and the health burdens of those water policies. And they're uneasy about the historical and continuing lack of concern about their issues. Scientists believe the problem is we don't have enough good science. We don't have enough good information. And the scientific perspective and I'm a scientist by training, is that if we just knew more about fish biology, if we just monitored groundwater better, if we had a better sense of the way global climate change was going to affect regional hydrology and regional water availability, or if we had a better sense of the human health impacts of pharmaceuticals in groundwater or in our urban water systems, then the rationality of knowledge and science would lead policymakers to make better decisions about water policy and about environmental policy in general. And economists have a perspective as well. Economists believe if we just priced water rationally or developed markets for water, then the rationality of economics would make our system work more efficiently and water would be allocated to the right user at the right time in the right way and that would solve our water problems. And lawyers have a perspective that you get, you get the idea. If water laws and, and water rights were properly adjudicated and analyzed and implemented uh, and our systems were effective, then our water policies would, would be better off overall. And there are lots of other perspectives. Southern California has a different perspective than Northern California. Farmers north of the Delta have a different perspective than farmers south of the Delta. Farmers that grow rice have a different perspective than farmers that grow almonds or alfalfa. 
Farmers on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley have a different perspective than farmers on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. Environmentalists who favor wilderness may have a different perspective than environmentalists who favor sustainable agriculture and small community farms. And there was an interesting fight about that still ongoing out at Marin at Point Reyes. So I raise this issue of perspective because I think it helps explain in part the lack of progress in many areas of California environmental policy, not, not just water policy. And given all of these differences, perhaps it's no surprise that it's hard to find common ground. In fact, in fact, maybe it's a surprise that we find common ground at all, given all of those different perspectives. We all want to reach solutions. Farmers want solutions as much as urban water users want solutions. But we can't always agree on what those solutions are. <laughs> So rather than try and pick and choose among these different perspectives of the problem, maybe we can say, I can say a little bit about what I think the water problem isn't to begin. California's water problem, and, and some could argue the global water problem, is not a problem of a lack of resources, a lack of water, or money, or brains, or infrastructure. Absolute scarcity of water is not our problem. Now, there are places around the world where absolute scarcity of water is a problem. Not for the most basic human needs for water. Even in water poor areas, there's enough water to meet basic human needs for water. Uh, but there are places that have scarcity problems far greater than California, for example. California, in many ways, is a relatively rich, water rich area. We have regional problems. We have problems with distribution. We have problems with allocation. But, but we, we're not water poor. Uh, California actually, even given our relatively large population, has a fairly good amount of renewable water resources. Um, on the order of about 2,500 cubic meters of water per person per year, on average, renewable water supply. Now, I understand that that number may not mean much. 2,500 cubic meters of water per person per year. It, it, it's just a number. Um, in the water world, there is some sense that a region or a country that has more than 1,700 cubic meters of water per person per year is not water stressed. You have to get to 1,700 or less to be even considered water stressed at all. And true scarcity is regions that might have less than 500 cubic meters of water per person per year. So we have 2,500, we're nowhere near that. Israel has, is at about 450 cubic meters per person per year. Singapore is about 200. The United Arab Emirates is around 100. We're at 24, 24, 2500. Kuwait has about 10. So in terms of absolute scarcity, California doesn't rate in terms of shortages of water. We're not short of water. We're not short of money. We're rich. Again, not everybody is equally rich. There are serious problems with distribution of economic wealth and natural resource wealth. But shortage of money is not the problem. And in fact, there's plenty of money to solve our water problems. At the global level, the amount of money required to provide 100% of the planet's population with water and sanitation is a paltry amount of money. By some estimates, it's 50 or 60 or $70 billion a year. That's not a lot of money at the global level given what we spend on a lot of different things. Uh, so shortages of money are not really the issue as well. We're also rich in other ways. We're incredibly rich in terms of our educational resources and our level of intelligence and our sophistication. Uh, I would say we're relatively rich in our ingenuity. California is an incredibly ingenious, innovative state. I think we're rich in good wills, in goodwill. Again, all these things are not equally distributed. I understand that. And so distribution of these things is really the nature of the problem. But poverty of any of those things is not our problem. Lack of intelligence isn't our problem. We've decoded the human genome. We manipulate substances at the subatomic level. We use smart machines and technologies to explore the universe around us. There, there's a machine roving around on Mars right now that just this week 
once again confirmed that there was water on Mars. And not only was there water on Mars, but apparently at a pH and chemical composition that was suitable for life. So, so maybe we just need to build a pipeline. To, to, if, the, if the peripheral tunnel doesn't work, we can build a pipeline to Mars. Okay, pipelines. Lack of infrastructure is not our problem either in California. We have no shortage of infrastructure. In fact, we have more water-related infrastructure in California than just about anywhere else in the world. And I think recent proposals for a couple more big dams in California or pipelines or, or the, the massive tunnels under the, under the delta, this is going to get me in trouble. Um, those proposals typically result, in my opinion, from a, a, a knee-jerk response that infrastructure is the answer. That's been the traditional response to the assumption, and I'll come back to this assumption a little bit later, the assumption that the demand for water has to grow with our population and with our economy. Uh, that if the economy grows and our population grows, the demand for water has to grow, and if the demand for water has to grow, we need more infrastructure, because that's the way we solved our problems, our water problems in the 20th century. But a more rational analysis of the broad nature of our water problem would suggest that that's not going to be enough. We may build a couple more big dams in California. We may build peripheral tunnels through the delta or under the delta. But I would like to suggest that even if we do those things, the nature of our water problems at the end of the day isn't going to be different. It's going to be the same. It's going to be a problem of allocation and efficient use and smart management. And there's always going to be a demand for more, a theoretical demand for more water. And in fact, each new proposal and each new project for infrastructure comes with increasingly high economic, political, environmental, and social costs. Costs that we're not very good at calculating. We can calculate and I have an engineering degree, I, we can calculate what it costs to build these things. And again, this week in the news, the latest estimate for the peripheral tunnels was $23 billion. Now, it's $23 billion, and that doesn't include financing costs. It's going to be $60 billion. It probably doesn't include operation and maintenance costs over the lifetime. Uh, those are real, that's real money. Uh, and uh, anyway, so en enough about that. I do want to be explicit, though. I'm not opposed to infrastructure. Uh, there are parts of the world where new infrastructure is needed, where new dams are needed, new pipeline is ne pipelines are needed. Uh, parts of Africa where there's a real paucity of water infrastructure, water treatment systems, water delivery systems. I do want to suggest that if we build new infrastructure, it ought to be built to a different standard than we build it today, where we take into account the opinions and perceptions of local communities and impacts on local communities, where we think about the ecological impacts of that infrastructure as well. Uh, that, that's an important issue. So infrastructure is important. It's an important part of the solution, but it's not the only part of the solution. So if California's water crisis is not the result of a lack of water or money or infrastructure or brains, then what is it? In part, it's a lack of vision about where we want to be and a lack of a clear path from where we are to where we want to be through the morass of old systems that we've put in place over the last 150 years, uh, through the old issues of water rights and laws and the old infrastructure and the old treatment systems we put in place and so on. So for the remainder of my talk, let me offer an alternative plan maybe audacious, I don't, I don't know, um, and offer a positive vision of where I think we, we could go. First of all, what do we want? So here are some of the most important things that we want. We want a strong economy that allocates water effectively and efficiently and uses water effectively and efficiently. We want smart working cities that have reliable, high-quality water. We want healthy agricultural communities 
throughout the state and agricultural production with less uncertainty about water. Reducing uncertainty to the agricultural community is, has an incredible value to them. We want successful restoration and protection of California's ecosystems. We want collaboration and public participation in decision making about water. We want the decisions about water to be made by a larger community than made decisions about water in the 20th century. So I think those are things that we want. And I think if you were to ask any of those different actors, the ag community, the urban community, scientists, economists, lawyers, the environmental justice community, I think you could get agreement about the broad sense of what we all really want. But how do we get them? So let me talk a little bit about that and let me focus on urban centers of the future. So first, we have to rethink our concept of supply for water. Again, we might build one or two more dams in California. We might build the peripheral tunnels, although no one rational <laughs> argues that the peripheral tunnels are going to increase the water supply. It's a way of changing the way water is delivered through the delta. It's potentially a way of increasing reliability to urban water users south of the delta. Uh, it's an opportunity potentially for improving water quality while restoring ecosystems. So, but it's not a water supply project per se. But there are some opportunities to increase supply in California. One of them is conjunctive use, the smart combined use of groundwater systems and surface water systems, where we do a better job of recharging groundwater aquifers that we've overpumped during wet years, in a sense as a new reservoir, and using those groundwater aquifers when surface supplies are low during drought years. We already do this in many basins in California, and we could do a lot more of it. And that's potentially a new source of supply, and it's a different way of managing water resources statewide. We have to learn tradition or relearn traditional methods of rainwater harvesting. There's a rainwater cistern on this building. And California, parts of California are not great for rainwater harvesting because we have a short rainy period and then a long dry period. But there are opportunities even in a place like California for rainwater harvesting systems. Perhaps most importantly, we have to learn that treated wastewater isn't a liability, it's an asset. It's a water supply. We spend a lot of money treating, capturing, collecting, treating wastewater. And in too many places, we then throw it away. That's an incredibly valuable resource for all sorts of end uses of water, up to and including potable uses of water, but not necessarily. There's public opposition to that. That's an educational question uh, in part. But there are lots of things that we use water for that don't require potable water. And increasingly, we're using treated wastewater for groundwater recharge, for power plant cooling or industrial cooling, uh, for land, outdoor landscaping, for all sorts of things that don't necessarily re require potable water. Um, and EBMUD, our water utility, and Richard Harris is here, uh, has done a lot of work in that area and could do lots more uh, and is working in that direction. And more and more water utilities are. That's a source of supply that doesn't require taking more new water out of the ecosystems that are already stressed. So tomorrow's urban centers are going to include different kinds of supply, including more local supply and sophisticated distribution systems and sophisticated local treatment and reuse systems. And that's going to be a change from the way we built our cities in the past. Second, we have to apply proper economic tools. Water has to be properly priced. The failure to price water properly leads, leads to overuse and underinvestment and poor economic decisions. And most of us don't pay enough for water. If we pay anything for water, I would, I would guess that every one of us in the room who pays for water pays less for water monthly than we pay for our cell phones or our internet connection, or our energy, or our landlines, if you still have a landline, or our cable TV, any of those. I'll bet your water bill is less than all of those things. And, it, and that's okay, but it's not okay if the cost of providing reliable water to you 
including the ecosystem's cost of doing that, should be higher, then you should pay the full cost so we could all pay more for the water we use. But water should also be fairly priced to protect the poor, uh, to make sure equi equity is addressed, uh, to encourage efficient use. And so that means eliminating some subsidies for water. It means comprehensive monitoring and metering of all water use. It means smart meters. So the city of the future will have comprehensive smart metering of our utilities. And we're moving in that direction faster in energy, but we're beginning to move in that direction in water. And Peter Yalis will talk to you more about that, who's done some incredibly innovative things on smart water metering. Uh, and pricing to cover the full costs of providing the services that we want. And, and get. Third, we have to protect water quality and do a better job of matching water quality and water demands. And I've talked a little bit about this, but it would be nice if we had accurate real-time monitoring of water quality for a lot of different things that we don't monitor for at the moment. And more serious efforts to protect many communities, including Central Valley communities, from water contamination. The Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, which I mentioned a little bit at the beginning, need a 21st century update, or a slap in the face, some could argue. They were great. They were incredibly important. They are the foundational water laws of the nation, but they need to be brought up to date. Different water uses require different qualities, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, but if we were better at matching the quality of water we had with the quality of water we needed, we could reduce the demand for new water, and we could, uh, we could operate our systems much more efficiently. Often, the best way to deal with wastewater is not to produce it in the first place. So if we can think about ways of reducing the generation of wastewater, that has incredible multiple co what we call co-benefits. Anything we do to reduce the production of wastewater reduces the need to provide the water in the first place. It reduces the need to build new water collection systems. It reduces the cost of expanding our wastewater systems. It reduces the energy cost of treating wastewater, and so on. There are lots of co-benefits from not producing this stuff in the first place. Fourth, we have to expand our concepts of management and regulation and water institutions. We need to address growth in a more responsible manner. And we're not going to talk much about growth, but, but a lot of all of the things that I've been talking about are driven by growth and challenges of meeting gro of growing demands of a growing population. I don't know if we'll get the population issue under control. I'm not giving a population talk at the moment, uh, but we need to. And even in a growing population, we have to think about growth in a responsible manner, in a different matter, manner. We need to move more toward local water management and to regional integrated water management. Uh, we need to complement the centralized facilities that we've built with decentralized facilities. And that's a challenge in an existing city, but over time, as we refurbish our infrastructure, there are opportunities to do that as well. And we need to bring local communities and local voices into decision-making roles and responsibilities. Fifth, we have to do more with less water. And this is the opposite. This is the other side of the supply coin. That's the demand question. We have to grow more food with less water. We have to flush our toilets with less water. We have to wash our clothes with less water. We can produce more energy with less water. We can do more of everything with less water. And those of you who know me or know the work of the Institute, know that we do a lot of work at the Institute on efficiency and productivity. How can we do the things we want with less water? The issue is not brown lawns and shorter showers. That's deprivation. The issue is productivity and efficiency. It's washing our clothes with washing machines that use less water. It's growing as much food as we grow in the Central Valley or more with precision sprinklers or efficient crop types, or smart soil moisture monitors that let us water crops when they need it rather than on a random schedule of when water is delivered. Efficiency and productivity is the challenge. We can reduce our demand for water without reducing the goods and services that that water provides. And that's fundamental as well. And the good news there, and again, I think you'll hear more about this from others this afternoon, 
is that we're already moving in that direction. Individuals and water districts and water agencies and corporations and countries are moving toward improving efficiency and productivity of water use. The United States uses less water today for everything than it used 30 years ago. On a per capita basis, that means we use a lot less water today than we used 30 years ago. And again, people have heard me speak, I often show a slide that shows our economy growing exponentially and our population growing exponentially, but our water use has peaked and leveled off and is going down. And in part, that's because of improvements in water use efficiency. It's also because of the change of the nature of our economy. It's due to a lot of different factors, but in part, a significant part, it's due to progress in improving water use efficiency. And California uses less water than we used 30 years ago, and Berkeley and Oakland and Ebmud uses less water than it uses 30 years ago. 30 years ago? 40 years ago. And Los Angeles does as well. It's a, it's a measure of the realization, first of all, that there isn't that much more supply out there. We've run up against the limits, and it's cheaper and easier to save waste, wasted water than to build another dam or to tap another groundwater well or bring water now from the Missouri to Las, Las Vegas or whatever the proposals are. So that's, I think that's remarkable news. And our cities of tomorrow are going to be incredibly efficient, more efficient than they are today, much more efficient than they are today. Sixth, we have to integrate climate change into everything that we do. Not just water, but everything that we do. But in the water area, into design, into the way we think about water use and demand, into water management, we have to do what we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have to, or we're on an exponential curve we don't want to be on. But no matter what we do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we're committed, I'm, I will argue, to unavoidable climate change. And we already see it. Unfortunately, we see it in, in a disturbingly accelerating manner. And so not only do we have to reduce emissions, but we have to think about adaptation. And a large challenge, a large part of the challenge, is the impacts of climate change on water systems. Because the hydrologic cycle is the climate cycle. Evaporate, higher temperatures, more evaporation, and acceleration of, of extreme events, uh, more demand for water in the Central Valley of California, uh, changes in, uh, in the frequency of extremes of storms coming off the Pacific, which is how California gets much of its water, and so on. Loss of snowpack in the Sierra Nevada. We're going to have to think about cities of the future that not only are efficient in the water area, but are smart in terms of climate adaptation, that have in place comprehensive adaptation plans for dealing with extreme events of all kinds, hydrologic, uh, extreme heat events, coastal cities that have to deal with sea level rise, and so on. It's time that we recognize the need for a new path for water, what I've often called a soft path for water. I think we're already on that path. I think we're in a transition to a smarter, more efficient, more effective water system uh, in the future. I think that transition could be faster. I think that transition may be slower and more painful than we'd like it to be. But understanding where we want to be and understanding the paths to get there, whether we're talking about water or energy or, or anything, I think is the key to developing good policies to move to that future. I think we face some pretty serious risks and unresolved environmental problems and unresolved water problems. But I think there are also real, effective, affordable, smart, innovative solutions out there uh, that are going to help us make that transition. And the challenge will be to make sure that that transition happens fast enough to avoid the pain that we're going to experience otherwise. Thank you very much. Hi, Peter. I'm Meredith Younghein. I'm with both the State Water Board and the Public Utilities Commission. Really appreciated your talk. And um, wanted to get to the issue of accelerating change in the water sector. Something that state policymakers tried a few years ago was introducing the concept of a public goods charge for water so that we could um, accelerate the transition to greater water conservation in the state the same way that we're accelerating the transition to climate mitigation. We're not really doing the same on climate adaptation. 
but um, what do you think the state could do in terms of creating some, you know, faster progress in water conservation and incentivizing water agencies and local governments to create this new infrastructure that we need? So there are lots of answers to that at lots of different levels. Um, you, you asked it sort of at the state level. Uh, I'm actually a fan of a public goods charge for water. Uh, I'm not sure we'll ever get one. That's a political challenge. Um, but even a tiny public goods charge could raise funds to do innovative things. Now, I understand also a public goods charge could raise funds to do bad things. So that, you know, what we do with the money, whether we can raise the money in that sense is one question. What we do with the money is, is another sense. But maybe, maybe you can answer this question. We spend, we spend hundreds hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, every year on energy efficiency statewide. Uh, the amount of money we spend on water efficiency is tiny compared to that. And that's part of the problem. Uh, that could be addressed with a public goods charge. But the other part of the answer to your question is there are lots of things that can be done not at the state level, but at the local level. I worry about this on the climate debate. You know, are we ever going to have a global climate convention? I don't know. Probably not. But there are really remarkable things happening at the local level that's driving the process forward. Are we ever going to have a, an agreement at the national level on climate? Well, not with the current cl Congress, but remarkable things are happening. And California has a cap-and-trade system. And if it's at all effective, other states will have a cap and trade system and, and the improvements will bubble up in many ways. So for water, there's some really smart, innovative, local water conservation programs. Uh, we have them here in, in the East Bay, we have them in San Francisco, we have them in Los Angeles and Marin, and there's some really smart water districts doing smart things. I, I would argue none of the water districts are doing everything they could be doing, but the more they do and the more they show that it's cost effective, that it saves water, that it reduces wastewater costs, that it cuts energy costs, then the more likely other agencies are, are going to adopt those innovative strategies. And the same is true in agriculture. Farmers don't like, we've done a lot of work at the Institute on agricultural efficiency. Farmers aren't really that interested in hearing what, what the Pacific Institute in Oakland, California, an academic institute thinks about agriculture, even if they're doing the things that we recommend. It turns out that farmers learn best from smart farmers. So one of the programs we have is uh, looking at innovative agricultural programs and how farmers learn from farmers and exchanging information and so on. So I think that kind of thing, th those combinations of efforts, uh, I think are what's going to move, move us forward. They're already what's moving us forward. University of Pacific at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And I think one of the missed opportunities in California, at least from a water quality and environmental restoration perspective, is the fact that we tend to manage and think of our agricultural water and our drinking water as one big unit. And do you know if there's any effort to try to separate out the drinking water from the ag water? Because from a, you know, a use and water quality perspective, they're totally different objectives. Well, well, they are they are totally different, and we and they are treated differently to some degree. Not when they're, you know, you go to the Tracy plants; they're pumping water that needs to be quality for drinking water. It's not just targeting mid-range water quality for agriculture. You see what I'm saying? It, yeah, in part. It, um, our, our big delivery systems deliver water, independent of quality. Uh, the water that we get out of our pipes is treated subsequent to that. It's downstream of that. The water that's delivered to agriculture is not potable drinking water. No, but it's a lot of the management in the delta is based on trying to keep water quality at yes. a certain level at the pump, at those intake pumps. Yes, that, that's right. In fact, part of the argument in the delta, that's precisely right, uh, is we have a water quality challenge from an urban perspective at the delta. And if we can reduce the water quality risks in the delta, even if we don't need to reduce them for agriculture, then... That's driving some of the economic demands. But to, that's also keeping a lot of the restoration activities down is because they have to keep certain water quality levels in that area. Yeah. Whereas for ag, you don't need it. But for drinking water, you don't want a lot of organic carbon, right. nitrogen. That would be a problem. But for agriculture, it's not. 
Yeah. No, well, it, it's in part gets to the point I made, and, and yeah, uh, like there's no real effort to try to separate out those two about matching the quality of water yeah. supply with the quality of demand, and, yeah. and there's enormous variety. You know, part of the question is, um, uh, I, there is a growing effort to build desalination plants at the coast. Uh, I've written a lot about this, and I've mixed feeling, I've incredibly mixed feelings about it, but there is an argument to be made. If we built smart, cost-effective, environmentally sound desalination plants, if we could do that, in Southern California, and reduce the demand for water from the Delta for Southern California, that's another way to, to, to rethink the system. Um, so it partly addresses your, your issue. But. Yes, hello, I'm uh, Ryan Puglisi and I'm an undergraduate student. I, you mentioned the need for um, uh, the public perception to change with regard to uh, wastewater. And I was wondering if you noticed any differences between populations that were willing and receptive to um, utilize um, more innovative measures for wastewater, um, as opposed to some that maybe these programs failed or they were unable to get the widespread support necessary for them to occur. Well, so there, there are two issues there. One is uh, populations that are really seriously water stressed, that don't have many options, uh, find it easier to accept alternative sources of supply. But more importantly, this is an educational issue. The places that have had success in adopting high quality treated wastewater for almost any purpose, including up to potable drinking water, are those places that have spent a lot of time and, and effort educating their consumers about what that means. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular about Singapore. Singapore is a relatively water scarce area. They're dependent on Malaysia, another country, for a, a part of their water supply, which they consider a, a political liability. Um, it has a small land area. They have a small natural endowment of water. Uh, they have a very sophisticated water, wastewater collection and treatment system. They call it new water. Uh, it produces potable drinking water quality water that they don't yet use for direct potable reuse. They put it in reservoirs that's used for some commercial and industrial purposes, but they, they will use it for direct potable reuse. But for years, they've had a very smart educational program educating the consumer about the quality of water they're producing. Because you can produce the most high quality water from anything with the technology that's already commercially available. So education is a big part of it. Orange County's had a, a wastewater reuse, treatment and reuse system for, for a long time and has had a pretty sophisticated educational program. But it's a challenge because the first reaction is yuck. And, and there are plenty of people in the community who when they hear that there's a plan to build a wastewater treatment plant and use the water for something, are unilaterally opposed to it without knowing what, what the story is, without understanding it. There's a bit of a knee-jerk response even among some of my friends about, about that. So education is part of it, and then, frankly, desperation is part of it. When, when you just don't have alternative sources of supply, it becomes a realistic option. I would note for California, it's a long, we're gonna be, a, we're going to use more and more treated wastewater, but it's going to be a long time before we need to use it for potable reuse, direct potable reuse. We, we don't even need to go there uh, for a long time. So. Hi, yeah. Peter. Uh, my name is Christine Boyle, and I'm with um, Blue Horizon Insight and also a visiting scholar at University of North Carolina. Um, so my question is about, you named a few utilities that are kind of on the the brink of kind of leading the nation in terms of progressive water technology and progressive rights. But my worry is that the bulk of the utilities across the country are really risk averse and reluctant to adopt um, in increased in, uh, efficiency technologies. And my, my main concern is that the, the, the water technology sector, the innovators, all of our Silicon Valley friends that are like, kind of like real masterminds at pushing technology and innovation, are going to stop making investments into um, water efficiency and at the rate that they're making investments into energy efficiency because water utilities are a bit um, kind of slow adopters of these technologies for a lot of different reasons. So my question is, how can we as a group or as a sector kind of 
push the, the margin in terms of getting, um, getting you know, more like kind of local governments and utilities to get on board with sort of progressive and efficiency related technologies? Well, there are lots of things that drive utilities toward efficiency and conservation. Um, one is a shortage of new sources of supply. It makes it hard. Uh, another is smart economics. If you treat water economic as a properly from an economic perspective, and you really look at the cost of conservation and efficiency programs versus the costs of new supply, many conservation and efficiency programs are cheaper. Um, I don't think it's a necessarily a question of coming up with new technology. There's plenty of technology out there for improving efficiency at cost effectively al already. Um, so part of it is pricing water properly. Part of it is making it as hard as possible to do the wrong thing on the supply side uh, so that when supply is constrained because of environmental and political and economic challenges, conservation becomes a more realistic option. Uh, part of it is smart regulation. We have a requirement in California that there be a 20% improvement in urban demand uh, by 2020. And there, I won't get into the nuances of whether it's really 20% by 2020 or how you measure it or, or, or so on. But, but it is an indication of a regulatory requirement that we begin to think about this across the board. So there, there are lots of pieces to that puzzle. Um, I'm not, I, I, but I don't think new technology, I'm all in favor of new technology when it's better. Uh, and I think, well, it's adoption of existing technology. That's a challenge. Um, again, in the old days, water utilities knew how to build a reservoir or raise a reservoir or drill a groundwater well, and they knew how to calculate how much water they were going to get. It's more difficult to implement a water conservation program and know how much savings you're going to get. Now, we have more and more experience with that. But it's a harder thing. And it's a harder thing to deal with the individual preferences of 100,000 users than with uh, 10 engineers who can build a dam. It, it's, a, it's a different mindset. It's, I, it's, when I talked about the need for new institutions and new thinking, it's related, it's related to that challenge. But we are moving in that direction. And there are innovative water agencies doing innovative things. And I think that's, I, I really think that's going to be the future. Uh, Martin Smith, Berkeley Institute of the Environment. One um, thing I don't think you mentioned, but maybe I missed it, was this potential salination of the delta through sea level rise, and what you think the impact of that will be on California and what the best possible solution is. Uh, okay, so I didn't mention it directly. I, I mentioned the water quality worries that we have in the delta. Part of the reason we're trying to fix the delta is because of ecosystem collapse, but part of it is water quality. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm not... I, I'm not unilaterally, ideologically opposed to some sort of infrastructure fix in the Delta. Um, the Delta water delivery system is a fragile, complicated, it, it's, a, it's, let me put it this way. If, if we had to do it from scratch, we wouldn't build the system today that we built over the last century. And part of the challenge is that the water delivery system is dependent on a fragile system of levees that direct water at different parts of the year to different parts of the delta and ultimately to the pumps in the southern part of the delta where they're pumped to Southern California and the Central Valley. Everybody knows those levees are delicate and fragile and vulnerable to earthquake and vulnerable to severe flooding in the winter and so on. And part of the argument in favor of a peripheral canal or a peripheral tunnel is reducing the risks that the delta levee failure suggests. And sea level rise is another component to that. Sea levels are going up from climate change. That's pushing salt fronts back into the, further up into the delta, and that's a water quality problem as well. So I acknowledge that we have to fix the delta. Um, I'm just not convinced that we've, we're having the right debate about how to do it. 